Man, it's great being here with you. I, I, students, I love students. Uh, it's, it's what I love. I love. I love this moment, whether you're a traditional or not traditional, whatever, whatever life stage you're in. It's a, it's a joy to be here with you this, um, this afternoon, this lunch hour. And, uh, and so we have a church that, that planted four years ago, uh, started from nothing, and, uh, and God's just doing a great work in our community there. And uh, we believe in missions as well. I, I just want to echo that. I, I, I just loved what they said. It's just like, I never felt a test by going on a mission trip. <laughs> it, it's amazing how we, how we believe these lies all the time or how we believe this dialogue of, Oh man, I can't go. I'm overwhelmed. I'm too busy. I don't have the money. I don't have this. I don't have that. And, and I just I want to encourage you. That's just not true. It's just like now God's economy doesn't work like that. It, it never has worked like that, right? Um, as you as you begin to sow into the kingdom, you're going to find yourself reaping the benefits of that. You're going to find yourself actually reaping the rewards of that. And God will add to your days, add to your number, add to what he, um, what, what he has planned for you. And so I just encourage you, give now. Don't give later. How many of you know that's like a true principle? Like, oh, man, I'll, I'll go on a missed trip after I graduate, after residency, when I actually start making some money, I take some time off. Anybody ever believe that? It's like, that never happens. That never happens. It's like... You just have to start now. You just have to go now and watch what God can do. Um, if you have your Bibles or Bible phone or anything like that, we're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 1. It's the minor prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk, uh, he, he asked these questions to God. He asked some really challenging, hard, difficult questions for God. And, uh, and because he is seeing pain, he's seeing suffering, he's seeing so much Happen. How many of you have dealt with like any little a minute piece of suffering this semester? Anybody, you know, those, those professors, you just want to be justice and pay them back. <laughs> like, I'm gonna test you. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I often want to do. And, and I, you know, I haven't experienced, I'm 36 and I, I've been sheltered in a lot of ways, and I have experienced maybe the depths of suffering or pain like many of you um, may have gone through personally or, or maybe uh, vicariously through a friend as you were there. And I haven't done this much, um, but I, I remember 2006. 2006, some of you weren't born. Um, 2006, <laughs> so long ago, I was, uh, I was single, I was 20, uh, four years old, uh, the, the life was just open, I could do whatever I wanted, like no limits, you know, I had a credit card, uh, you know, it was awesome, I, you know, there's so much independence, so much freedom, and, and it was Christmas Eve, and we had a Christmas Eve service at our church, I was a young single youth pastor, which is so much freedom, and, and I didn't know what to do on Christmas Eve, so I decided to go out to on the border Mexican food restaurant with my friend Lane, who was the worship leader of this church, and, and we were both single, so we didn't have anybody to go home to. And you ever felt like that? Maybe, maybe some of you bought a dog, you know, or <laughs> something like that. And uh, this was us, and we 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 ate this Mexican food. It was delicious. It was awesome. Uh, at every bite, as I was eating, I was kind of sad that I didn't have a significant other to spend with, but I was also um, just soaking it up like, man, this is amazing. I just get to sit here and eat, and I have no curfew, and I have no responsibilities, and I don't have to go home to anybody. And the food was delicious, amazing. Went home that night. That night, I'll never forget, it was Christmas Eve. I hugged my parents. I loved them, and, and I was so excited for presents. You still excited for presents? Like, yes. <laughs> Yes, give me a gift, something, something that I don't have to use student loan for, please. <laughs> like, like, that's where I was, and I was so excited and, uh, for gifts, and, and then in the middle of the night, as I was sleeping, I heard some rumbling, you know. <laughs> you ever heard that rumbling? Yeah. Like, not from your throat, but a little lower, down in your stomach. Really any lower than that, down, down really low, and you knew it was not going to be good. And... <laughs> And all I could think about was that moment with my friend, and we're enjoying life and eating this chicken fajita, and it tastes so tender. 
but I think maybe a little too tender. And I went to the bathroom toilet, I hugged the toilet, and I just started throwing up all over the toilet on Christmas Eve. And, and at the same time, I had to go on the other end, and it was coming out both ends. <laughs> Are you enjoying your Chick Fil A right now? <laughs> yeah, at least it's not Mexican food. Too shame. And um, and it was horrible. It was a horrible moment. It was a horrible experience, right? And 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 I was sitting there. Has anybody had food poisoning in here? Like yes. You know, like you know that experience. And, and then after you throw up your guts, you think, for the love of God, like it's not going to come back. It's good, you know. And in that moment. When you are throwing up, all you want to do is die, right? Am I, am I the only one who's wanted to die more than once in this life? Like, the pain is so horrible. And I love that you're in the medical profession because you're gonna have people come in to your room and they want to die. Like, they want to die. And, and it's amazing, like, watching somebody that because it's like, just food poisoning. You're gonna live, it's gonna be okay. Um, you know, just an IV will, will do you just fine, but, but Man, I wanted to die, and Christmas Day was ruined. I couldn't open gifts. I, I just sat there, miserable. Um, my dad's trying to take pictures of a 24-year-old opening his gift. And it's, just, it's just a really sad story. And, and it was so much pain. And, and I just, I think about pain, and I think about life, and I think about suffering. And, and the truth is, is that's just a very minute piece of pain and suffering. It was going to be gone just a couple of days. I got a little nauseous, didn't want Mexican food for at least a week. And and I think, you know, for some of us, we've had pain like that, and we just wanted to die. And, uh, and then there's some of us who've been dealing with pain for an extended amount of time. Some of you weeks, some of you months, some of you a whole semester. Will I ever pass an exam? You know, some of you have been dealing with different pain. Some of you, it's family members with different diagnosis and stuff like that. And what I love about Habakkuk, as he writes this book 2,600 years ago, he, he writes this book and he has some hard questions for God because, you know, when pain happens, when there's a burden, how many of you know, like, you have some questions for God? Like, it's just not lining up with your biblical worldview. Like, like, why is there so much injustice? Why is there so much pain? Why is all this happening? And you begin to ask this. And in verse 2 and 3, this is the prophet crying out. He goes, How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? How, how many of you ever ask God a question like that? Like, you, you see the world around you and just not quite lined up with, with who you think God is and how it's going about. And you just have some hard questions. Or, or some of you and maybe have a, a parent or a grandparent who has gone through some really bad pain and it's a prolonged and it's suffering. And a lot of you have had questions for God and some of you have actually ended up in this medical profession to study it because you have questions and you want to be a solution to some of the problems that you see. You see, life is not as beautiful as we want it to be. You know, I, I wish I wish life was just like the scrubs. You know, I wish it was just like scrubs. You know, I wish it was just like, it, it was like, you know, it started nice. You know, you had a little bit of conflict and then it ended well, you know, at least most episodes, right? Unless they do want to create some real tension, you know, and leave you lingering for a couple more. Um, Life's not like that. Life is a, is a journey. It, it's, it's much like a drama. Have you found that to be true? It's much like a drama. It's much like, um, anybody watching This Is Us? It's just my wife and I are the only sappy ones in here. Like, it's crazy. We, we watch that and it just drags on and on season after season. And, and it's really tough. And life's like that, isn't it? It's like, you know, it, it's not necessarily so cookie cutter. It's not like, oh, man. Well, I'm going to apply for med school. I'm going to take this test. Oh, I got in. Oh, I'm in med school. Um, this is awesome. I'm going to sit around and do this study group. Oh, wow, there's a really nice, attractive person in the study group. And you get their number, and you go out, and you fall in love, and then you have kids, and then it's amazing, and it's happily ever after, dot, 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 and you go to Disney World, and you're like, like, like who wants that? Um, we all want that, but for a lot of us, it was... Oh, we applied for med school, and 
And we failed the MCAT and we had to retake it and we reapplied and re-interviewed and reapplied and, and it didn't go quite as I thought. And for some of us, we didn't get into our school one or whatever it is. And, and it just, sometimes it's just disappointing or you get here and you're very confident because you killed your test, right? You, you, you killed your entrance exam and you're like, man, this is gonna be awesome. And then you take your first exam and on there is an F and you're like, oh, what is going on here? This, I was the smartest person in my high school. What is happening? <laughs> You know, I think life's like that, and you begin to ask questions all the time. You ask questions to God. You ask questions of, I, I, I thought I was the greatest. I thought I was the smartest. Or I thought life was going to be a little bit different. But now it's taking a turn, and now I'm just struggling to keep up. Have you ever felt like that, where you just maybe even struggling to survive? You're in that season of pain, season of suffering, season of anxiety, season of stress. And am I really going to make it? You see, I thought it was going to be like this, but it actually is not as I thought it would be. And this is what Habakkuk was saying is, I'm seeing the world, and I thought it was supposed to be a certain way, God, but it's not how I thought it should be. And in verse 3 and 4, he says this, Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. Justice never prevails. Have you ever gone to God and asked him a question like that? Have you ever said like, God, I just don't really think life is fair. I, I don't think that it's really just, that it's really happening. Is it ever okay to question God? Did you grow up in an environment where you could ask these questions, where you could look at the world and you felt comfortable enough with this relationship that you have between God, you could actually ask him some questions and and I just wanna, I wanna alleviate you. I want, I wanna take something off of you. You can ask God questions. You can ask God questions. You can ask Him the hard questions. It, it, yes, you can question it. We read this all through the Psalms. The third of the Psalms are questions to God about how if there's people hurting and it's crying out from a hurtful heart. I, I, I want to tell you, like, you don't have to fake it around God. That, that's the one person that you should not think it around. That's the one person that you can actually be vulnerable with. Job wrote this. Lamentations wrote this. Ecclesiastes wrote this. Jer Jeremiah wrote this. These hard questions of confusion and pain and what's happening and what's going on and, and why. Why? I, I feel like life is like that for me personally. I've gone through some ups and downs, right? Some highs and lows. I'm going through this season where I'm on the mountaintop where I'm never going to question God. He's amazing. He, he revealed himself to me. I, I gave my life to him. I, I, I trust him wholeheartedly, uh, uh, so amazingly. And then, and then I'll never forget. I'll never forget my junior year of high school where I was working in a retail shop. And, and as I was doing, I was working on Sundays, and I found myself being more isolated from the family of God, from the community, from, from, from Christians. And, and as it, you're isolated, it feels like you, you ask a lot of questions, right? But not with a lot of perspective. You know what I mean? Like, there's nobody to counter any objective you have towards this. And so I started down God, and, and I was like, man, God, I just, I don't know if you're real. I don't know if you're real. I don't know if this is really true. See how I was seeing the world, and you know the best a 16-year-old can see the world, right? <laughs> you know, you look at your 16-year-old self, you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I, I was looking at the world like this, and I was driving around, and my dad pastored a small country church out in the country, and I was going to a larger youth ministry at the time, but I decided to show up at my dad's church, and I drove out there, and I guess... I guess it was like, I just wanted to see if God would show up or speak back or answer my questions of, I, of my doubts and insecurities. And I step into the church, I sit down, and I'm watching my dad preach a message, and, and I'm asking these questions like, I just don't know. I just don't know. And then for whatever reason, and maybe you've experienced this, God just showed up. It's like the conviction of the Lord just showed up. I can't even explain it fully, but, but I would say it's almost, it's almost a, just an audible experience where he just showed up and he said, I'm, I'm real. 
and I was overwhelmed. So I left the church, right in the middle of the sermon, you know, and maybe you've done that before. And, and I, I left the church, and I was just like, what was that? What was that? Who is he? And I was driving on this road, and I started getting more vulnerable with God. And I just broke down. I just said, God, you're real. You've always been real to me. You've always had my back. You've always been there. I know you're real. I love you. I'm sorry. It was a real moment of being vulnerable with the Lord. And in that moment, my, my faith swelled. You ever had that moment where, where you ask a question and God shows up and he answers and after he answers and after you press into him, after you draw into his presence, your faith just grows a little bit more? And I was on the mountaintop again and it was, it was amazing. And then, and then I got in college and, and in college it's like the land of philosophy, right? Like where you question everything. And uh, you question me if that's really your mom and dad and, you know, and all these things and, and, and just like ridiculous stuff. Well, I was wrestling with some theological concepts, and as I was wrestling between these theological concepts, this time instead of being angry at God, I leaned into God. I pressed into God, and, and I was really asking this question like, okay, God, I grew up in this certain dynamic and this certain paradigm that, that I had to do a checklist in order for you to love me. I had to earn your love. I had to earn it. I, I, I had to merit it. Like, like, it was much like you are in school. Like, oh man, that professor really likes me. I have to do well, you know? Like, you have that pressure on you to feel like you have to perform in order to be approved. And, and I read this book, Philip Yancey, and he says this. God loves people because of who God is, not because of who we are. God loves people because of who God is. That is his character to love. And all of a sudden, I was going to a, a deeper place with God as I embraced him and leaned into them. That, that, that God's character is love. And this was huge for me. And as a result, my faith began to swell in. And when we read Habakkuk 1.5, 1, 5, 1, 5, God responds to Habakkuk in these questions. He says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just want to put that verse up, like, okay, I'm taking this test. God's going to do something utterly amazing in my days. I won't even be told. Like, here we go. Here we go. We're going to take this test. It's going to, it's going to be amazing. And, and, and it's just going to be relief immediately. And how many of you know, like, when you're in pain, like, you want immediate relief, <laughs> right? You ever seen a patient like that? They're in pain. They want some morphine. I, I'll, I'll never forget my moment of going to the ER because... Because, you see, my stomach was hurting. My stomach was hurting because um, I was not treating my stomach so well. You know what I mean? Like, like you're living off of that, that, that unhealthy diet of cheesy tacos and, and tortillas and everything your Latino wife makes you. And, and just really a bunch of lard and it consumed in my body. And my stomach was painful. I really thought, like, it had to be cancer or something really horrific. We go to the ER and we sit there and... I'm in pain, hurdle, and, and the waiting time is like, you know, three hours to get into this emergency room because it's the only emergency room in Midland, Texas. And uh, for whatever reason, everybody was there. And as I was sitting there in pain, this horrific pain, this horrible pain, the doctor comes in and he gives me one small little pill. He says, take this pill. I took that pill with a big glass of water and I sat there in a couple of hours my pain was gone. It's amazing, right? Like, whoa, man, how could a pill do that? This is, this is a miracle. The doctor is a miracle worker. And I asked him, what was going on, doctor? And he said, you just had really, really bad heartburn. Just really bad heartburn. That's all. <laughs> it is amazing. Like, that's, that's hilarious. Like, I had heartburn. I thought I was going to die again. And running out to the Lord and... And it was just heartburn. And, you know, I think, wouldn't that be great if life was like that, where in every pain, in every suffering, in every moment, we could just take a little pill? You know, right? Like, we could just read verse 5, and it's like, hey, don't worry. You're going to be utterly amazed. I'm going to do something. But then we read verse 6. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, 
that bitter and hates the nation who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. And then he goes on and on. He says, it's about to get a lot worse before it gets better. It's about to get a lot worse before it gets better. And God, that's not the magic pill. You know, that's, that's a lot more pain, a lot more suffering, a lot more enduring, a lot more hardship. This is not how I thought it was going to go, God. And this is what God has said. And, and to be honest with you, it's like some of us go through pain and it's alleviated in a moment. But the others of us, we're, we're, we're just in this for a very long time. We're wondering where God is in this moment. And what does this look like? And why me? And why this? And I want to tell you, first off, that God understands your pain. He understands your pain, and he understands your season. He understands where you are. And don't deny your doubts, but, but let your doubts drive you to God. Let your questions drive you to God. Have you heard it said that, that God won't give you more than you can bear? Have, yeah, you've heard preachers say that. God won't give you more than you can bear. You can do this. Like, he's going to do that. And, and the truth is, is that God never said that. God never said that. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3.10, he says, I won't, give, I, won't, I won't let no temptation overcome you. That is not common to man. God is faithful and let, let you not be tempted beyond your ability. So God is going to make a way out for your temptation. A way out to when you, when you are overwhelmed and you just want to say you just want to cuss that professor out. Like, like he's going to make a way out of that temptation. A way out of the sinful acts that we would commit and do. He's going to say, hey, I've already paid a price for that. I, I sent my son Jesus and, and no temptation will overcome you. That, that you will not be overcome with that because I'm renewing your mind. I'm renewing your mindset. I'm going to change the way you think. Change the way you look at the world. Change your perspective. But guess what? I'm going to give you more than you can bear. And I'm going to give you more than you can bear all the time. Because when I give you more than you can bear, it doesn't draw you to yourself. Mm. It draws you to the Lord. And this is what God would have for you. That you would be drawn to Him and embrace Him any time you have more than you can bear. You know, I think today, a lot of us have more than we can bear. Right? Like, like we're, we, we don't have time for a Sabbath. We don't have time for anything. We don't even have time for lunch. We can just read over our notes, and we got a test coming up. God, can, you, can you hurry up and let us out of here? I, I, just, I feel like it's so much. But I want to tell you that in this moment, what are you being driven to? What are you being driven to? Are you being driven to God so that God can show up? Habakkuk's name means to wrestle and embrace. It's kind of what his name means. I'm going to wrestle with God and I'm going to embrace him in the midst of the pain. I just want to pray for you because it's not a quick sitcom. There's no finality to this message. And I didn't wave a wand or give you a pill to relieve all the stress and burden on your life. What I did, what I hope, is that you had a little bit more. Say, I'm going to be driven to God in this season. I'm going to be driven to his presence. And I'm going to draw near to him. And I know his burden is light. His burden is easy. And it's hopeful. And then I know that God has put me in this season for a reason. And in that reason, I'm going to embrace him. I'm going to see what he has for me. Can I pray for you as we close? Father, I just, I thank you, Lord, for CMDA, Father, who offers a free lunch to relieve burdens, to offer a free lunch to to help love on students practically. I thank you for that, God. I thank you for mission trips that help our faith swell in the season of difficulty. I, I thank you so much for that. But Lord, I know without a doubt there's people in here who are anxious, who are frustrated, who have questions, who may even be asking themselves, do I really belong here? Is this really where I'm supposed to be? And Lord, I pray that they would not be driven to their own dialogue, but they'd be driven to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who would speak in their circumstance and speak to them directly and say, I love you, and my character is love, and I'm not going to forsake you, and I'm not going to leave you in that burden. Come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you strength. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.